Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast of the Monarch Joint Venture National Conservation Training Center Monarch Conservation Webinar Series. My name is Tracy McLeaf. I'm a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service at the National Conservation Training Center, and we're glad you could join us today for, the, for our second webinar this month. I'd like to introduce you to Cora Lund Preston, the Communication Specialist at Monarch Joint Venture, and she'll tell you more about today's webinar and speakers. Cora? Thanks, Tracy, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. As Tracy said, uh, my name is Cora Lund Preston. I'm the Communication Specialist for the Monarch Joint Venture. I'm also joined on the chat box by Shelby from the MJV. Um, today, we're excited to have three experts on designing and creating signage and displays with us to share their knowledge. We have Rich Dolish, the Vice President for Conservation and Parks at the National Recreation and Park Association. Rich is responsible for development of national policy and initiatives related to conservation, environmental stewardship, and parks. Rich has worked 30 years in parks, outdoor recreation, and natural resource management at the local and state level in Maryland prior to NRPA. We'll also hear from Pete Carroll, an exhibit specialist for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. He has over 20 years of experience in sign, mural, and exhibit fabrication, and owns his own business and sign um, his own business in sign and exhibit design for 14 years. Angie Edwards is an account executive at Fossil Industries and brings a broad history of project management and sales experience to her work. Fossil Industries is a signage and mural company that works to make beautiful, durable, and environmentally responsible signs. If you have any questions today during our presentation, please enter them into the chat box. Shelby and I will be monitoring the chat box and we'll save your questions for our presenters. We'll have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar where we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. And now I'll turn it over to Rich to get us started. Well, thanks, Cora. And thank you to the National Conservation uh, Training Center and MJV for hosting today's webinar. Today's content is decidedly something different in the webinar series. And we're going to be talking about how to design and install attractive educational and interpretive signs for way stations and pollinator gardens. Uh, we want to make this as practical and as, as possible for you and to give you do's and don'ts, but we also want to stimulate some creative uh, ideas about the possibilities for signs that you can design and either fabricate for yourself or contract them up. And while we're going to cover interpretive and educational signs, we also want to talk about entrance signs and other possible exhibit ideas and how to effectively use them in way stations. I recognize there's a very diverse set of participants today, all the way from volunteer groups uh, who, who are managing one way station up through federal agency land managers that might have uh, thousands of acres and multiple sites. Each of your needs uh, will be different, but some basic principles apply to all the signs you might put up. And we hope that the variety of signs and materials choices you see today will open your eyes to the possibilities of what you can do. Signs and sign making uh, have undergone a revolution in the last 10 years, and there's a whole lot. Uh, you'd be surprised at how much you can do yourself um, on uh, just a laptop and uh, with some design software. So who's NRPA? We're the National Recreation and Park Association, uh, almost 60,000 members and 9,000 plus local urban and regional parks uh, comprise over a million acres of parkland. And we started a campaign uh, two years ago called the Parks for Monarchs campaign. And our goal is to get 1,000 agencies. We have well over 500 that are participating. And we'd love to see you join in. Easy to do. Uh, www.nrpa.org, Parks for Monarchs. And we'll provide that link later to, to uh, give you some uh, possibilities on how to share information and knowledge about parks. So NRPA. Um, has been involved, and as many parks people have, with putting up signs over the long haul in parks and gardens and historic sites. And I think as you began, you got to ask yourself, why put up a sign at all? If your waste station or pollinator garden has a public-facing purpose, that is, you, you're encouraging the public to visit it, or there's trails that lead you through it, or you have it in a prominent location, um, signs are a great way to identify what you're doing and why. And so if you're going to put up a sign, there's some simple principles to follow. 
And I uh, have this little picture of Pollinator Sanctuary. Uh, and uh, I don't know, that sign, something about that sign rubs me the wrong way. It, it's kind of the message as well. We really don't want you here, and if you do come, uh, we'd be happy if you went home soon, and you better not break any of our rules. Oh, by the way, if this is your sanctuary, pardon me, I apologize. Um, <laughs> I'm trashing anybody, but I, I speak very frankly about these. So why put up a sign? The purpose of placing a sign, uh, there's multiple purposes. One is to welcome people to, to your facility, your garden, um, your special place. Uh, you want to identify what's there and why it's there, so you're educating people. And it, many times you want to inspire them to either take action or to appreciate what's there. And uh, finally, a, a good sign uh, often has uh, directional purposes, too, to tell people where to go or what to do next. Um, here's a, I want to also ask the question, what makes a bad sign and what makes a good sign? Uh, I, I, and, if, and if I happen to mention one of your signs, I hope it's in as the good category. So this is about the worst sign I've ever seen. Not only is it ugly, but it doesn't suit the setting, and you can't figure out what it says. And until I stopped my car and got out and looked at it closely, I couldn't even tell what it was about. You, you can't find the date and the time and the purpose. Well, you can tell it's a St. Patrick's Day dinner. But I had to really search to find when it was. It's not on St. Patrick's Day, by the way, and what time it was. Two, probably two of the most important pieces of information that, that this sign is supposed to communicate. So what makes a good sign? Uh, clean design, legibility, the right amount of text for the setting, putting it in the right location for the right purpose. Um, this sign, which is a combined uh, effort of the park system and Kiwanis Club in the city uh, and a group called the Monarch Alliance, is a great community-based partnership for conservation. So every time somebody comes into this little way station, this is right along the CNO Canal in Hagerstown, they see who the partners are, what the purpose is, and why they're doing it. Uh, signs don't have to be expensive. Uh, they... They, uh, let me make a couple of comments about entrance signs, too. But so there's, there's a lot of low-cost materials. You'd be amazed at when you start to learn more about the revolution in materials is how uh, really inexpensive quality and durable, durable signs can be made. So they don't have to be expensive, but you also have to not uh, fall into the trap that your temporary sign becomes a permanent sign. I'd like to say a couple of words about entrance signs. And... Uh, Here's a few uh, that we have seen on uh, for monarch gardens and other pollinator gardens. This one is a little worse for the wear over time. You can see it's kind of beat up and the fasteners are starting to rust. But the sign is pretty attractive and meaningful in that it gives you a map. It draws you into the sign and makes you want to read and makes you want to find the, the sign, the, the butterfly garden at the end of this trail. And although I don't know how to pick up the pointer, there's a little inset there for to look for indicator signs along the way. Um, so entrance signs can enhance your educational goal, and the mere fact that they're visible to the public tells the conservation purpose of your habitat or restoration area. But you have to decide who your audience is. Are you, are you telling a story or just identifying a place and purpose? What's the right amount of text and how much is too much? And if there's one takeaway I can give you among all others, it's less is more. Uh, don't fall into the trap of putting everything you know about this subject on your sign. Stop yourselves. Uh, people don't read anymore anyway, and you got to get over it. Well, I'm exaggerating a little, but not much. So how long do you think people uh, read a sign? Uh, do they spend on reading a sign? Uh, we had a little discussion before we put the content of the webinar together and my guess is that people will give you about five to ten seconds maybe 15 if it's really interesting so if you have more text than you can read in 10 seconds you probably have too much so some uh, tips for how to do a good sign you want to break up text blocks don't have long lines of unbroken text use images with your text and keep the text to a minimum remember less is more uh, here's some examples of signs from simple and cheap to uh, 
expensive and uh, very nicely done, uh, professionally done signs. Uh, this kind of sign I'm not too much of a fan for. It seems to not be right for this setting. If you look, there's no path or vantage point in front of the sign. In fact, vegetation's growing up in front of it. And that might be nice that it's milkweed, but the fact is you can't get up close to that sign and read the text. Um, I would encourage uh, people who do uh, want to put more on signs, think less. Uh, here's a, some interactive signs, and these are kind of uh, fun. They're in a, very inexpensive. This was made with rebar and um, just kind of homemade um, simple flip cards on a ring. Um, and uh, one of uh, the volunteers at Patuxent uh, Wildlife Research Refuge uh, was, look, were look, was looking to work on upgrading the educational displays in an outdoor exhibit there. So she visited a number of places and took notes and watched people as they viewed these signs. These whimsically uh, uh, designed signs with a fair amount of text on them are the least engaging to visitors, she found. So signs that had an interactive component were close by the trail, enabled you to, you know, old-time nature signs that those principles are still tried and true, uh, were very engaging to to, member, to visitors. And the one that caught everybody's attention and people spent perhaps ten times the time in looking, reading, and uh, interacting with was this simple sign about bees. And it has a, a wheel on the top or a knob that you can rotate the sign and find the B and match its description. The text blocks are just the right size. The illustrations are nice and easy to understand. Um, and it shows, goes to show you don't need a whole lot of experience to just do simple, effective signs. Uh, here's some very professionally done signs that were done by the Smithsonian in the next to the Smithsonian institutions. Um, and it's this is the National Pollinator Garden that has been... Um, in the works for a couple of years, and it's a really nice little place right in downtown D.C. So the process for how they put these signs together, and I thank James Gagliardi, who's a horticultural supervisor there, for providing this information, started with kind of the theme selection and conceptualization. There's a loop trail inside this garden that they do tours with, and people can do self-guided uh, walking. Um, there's a duplicate slide here. But so they moved to script development and editing um, with a pretty careful, uh, consistent message uh, that was repeated visually and thematically throughout the display and some insets for people who wanted to read more. In a setting like this, where you have a guide who's taken a tour um, and you have people's attention well captured, they may want to read a lot of text. But I, I tell you that that is rare, and you really have to gauge who your audience is and your visitors' uh, tolerance for and, and willingness to read a lot of text and uh, learn a lot from your signs. So I uh, mentioned about the ADA compliance for how uh, everybody can visualize it and access it. And there's a picture of the garden right here. And if you need to get a hold of James, we'd be happy to share some of these contacts and links with you uh, later, both in my presentation, and Angie and Pete's to follow. So here's a really nice sign done by the National Park Service. Uh, I've, I've loved this sign, and there's a similar companion. Uh, both of these, by the way, are copyright-free, and they're available for you to download and potentially uh, uh, alter with to make them more specific to your particular site. But it has, uh, if you want to invest three seconds in reading this, there's enough of a message. If you want to invest five or ten, the, while well, the message is deeper and more meaningful. The illustrations are beautiful, and it's a really attractive, uh, well-composed sign. I give a lot of credit to those. I want to mention, too, that don't feel you have to do it all yourself. The, uh, the talent and ability of volunteers uh, that work with you, uh, this is from a, a journaling workshop, uh, an art workshop that was done in um, the Monarch Way Station in Montgomery County, Maryland's parks. Really attractive, appealing artwork can be found, original work can be found from your volunteers. Uh, so I haven't talked about cost for these signs. Angie and Pete are going to speak to relative and actual cost. But I want to tell you, don't be intimidated by cost. Yes, you can look to do a really inexpensive sign. But uh, you can also you know, set your sights high. This is the kind of project that volunteers love to raise funds for. 
uh, it's really attractive because they you can attribute their participation in, in the fundraising, and it's a kind of thing that you can go to foundations or business groups to to say this is what we're looking to do as an education. So I want to uh, tell you that a clean, well-designed, attractive sign in the right location is a is really nice. It is a uh, joy to behold, and it tells the message, engages the audience, and uh, really sets off what you're trying to do in a conservation frame of reference and an education. So in closing, I want to thank Denise Gibbs, James Gagliardi, Ann Korn, and some others who provided examples and photos. And I want to turn the presentation over to Pete Carroll, Sign and Exhibit Shop Supervisor for Maryland National Capital Park and Planning, who has over 30 years in the making of signs and exhibits. Pete? Hey, yeah, good afternoon. Thanks, Rich. Um, so I, I have a bunch of photos basically just demonstrating different types of materials we use at uh, the Merrill National Capital Park Planning Commission, and also I've used when I own my own business. Um, some of these may or may not pertain to what you're doing. It's just uh, newer, more modern, uh, longer-lasting materials. This is a, a sign foam. It's actually probably a third or fourth generation sign foam. We use it, we're using this for one of our larger facilities. It's very easy to machine. Um, this is gluing the uh, picture of gluing the uh, trim onto the sign. This is the actual trim that was machined with the CNC router to go onto the sign. Um, that is a, I would say, a fairly expensive material. Again, probably not in the realm of what we're doing. Um, Rich had spoken to uh, uses of signs and different ways to, to to um, invite people in. This is a gate that we made in-house um, for one of our uh, natural areas. And rather than have a sign, this gate actually serves two purposes. It, it is the sign, and it also is a gate that allows our maintenance people to get into the park and no other vehicles. Um, this is a sign that I, I believe I think everybody out there can do, whether they're a sign shop or they're not a sign shop. This is basically an image that was taken off of a Shutterstock site or someone's personal um, photograph. Uh, you can do like a 30% um, a opacity on the background and then set the text in the corners. It's a digital print with a 10-year UV laminate on it, and it's mounted to a piece of... 040 painted aluminum. The cost for this sign, which is something you could do if you have a, a basic um, graphics program, Illustrator, Corel Draw, um, would probably run about um, $15 for one. You wouldn't have to do a lot of them. Um, and it's something you can Google um, some sites on, uh, online that will do the, uh, the printing for you and the laminating and cut it for you. And there's several places, uh, uh, um, Grimco will sell the blanks. That I believe they're $3.97 a piece, and then it's very simple to put them together once you have that. Um, this next slide is basically in line. We have a program, Adopt a Trail and Adopt a Park. People clean them up, um, and uh, they'll volunteer to do that for us, which kind of cuts back on our maintenance cost for some of our parks and trails. This is um, a mass-produced product for for the monarch conservation, I believe, and this is silk screen. So it's you you, you can get the same look, um, but in, with that said, you're probably going to have to do uh, a large number of them to get your cost down um, to do something like that in house. Uh, this is again probably nothing that has to do with. Um, what we're talking about today. It's just a different means of outputting graphics. This is um, large format digital print similar to those uh, adopt park signs, and it's applied to half-inch sign foam. Uh, one is extremely cost-effective. I'm not sign foam, gator foam. It's uh, extremely cost-effective. It's a digital print. Uh, if you look down below the D and the, um, the uh, I there, this uh, stuff on the table is basically um, graphic images that are applied to this, the lipstick and the lips. And uh, again, this is all extremely cost effective. This is done for one of our um, community centers for a beauty contest. The shoes, the lipstick, and the letters are all flat images. They come across beautifully um, and are 
very inexpensive to do in-house. Uh, these vegetables on the table here are done exactly the same way. It's a digital print. It's mounted to a, a uh, expanded PVC substrate, which is great for outdoor signage. Um, the images are great. It's for a kid's garden. Um, uh, very inexpensive. You can outsource the plastic shapes. Um, there's you should find some place online that will do a CNC cut. You can send them a very simple AI file, uh, Adobe Illustrator vector file, to have that stuff cut. Again, it's very cost effective. Um, this gray, uh, this brown and white information, or the sign inside this wall here, is um, a King Color Core. Uh, again, slightly expensive product, very, very low maintenance. It's engraved. Um, they're just I'm just basically offering a lot of different types of materials to to get um, uh, ideas of what you can use. This is a larger or uh, further away image of the uh, Suitland Bog Gate um, as far as what it looks like when you pull up to the uh, to the facility. Um, the splash zone sign is again one of our facilities. It's it's a large format digital print on um, expanded PVC uh, and the fish on the window or static cling decals on the inside. So I can do the fish and I can do all the copy um, uh, on the window so that you can still see the, the, the uh, person that's uh, taking your money to get into the park. Um, just uh, creative ways to, to advertise and get the information across. This fish is something else we, do, we did in-house. Again, it's all the same process. Um, it will take a little bit of time to uh, to research uh, vendors around your area to get this stuff done, but it is th are, there are things you can do in house. This is um, basically an installation image for th this uh, product. If you look at the the round discs on the back of this, there th those are mounting discs. There will be a piece of all thread that goes on that, and this is the front side. So going back to the last. These, this picture here, these dots on the corner are a hole pattern to drill for these studs to mount these images on the wall to create a big mural in a lunch area. Um, this is the splash zone sign that was taken down after about a year and a half in direct sunlight. So the image quality lasts uh, for, the, for, the, for the amount of money you put in. It's, it's something that's long-lasting and very economical to do. Uh, this is a slightly more advanced sign. They're cast aluminum letters mounted on aluminum um, for a building. Very, very uh, long-lasting material and sign. Uh, this is an image of um, trail signs that we do in-house with a CNC router. Uh, the material is King Color Core. It is a high-density um, polyethylene. It's environmentally stable. Um, uh, and very long-lasting. It's pretty much vandal-proof. The signs, when they're finished, are mounted on a um, recycled fiberglass reinforced post. Uh, again, very, very, very low maintenance. Um, they're set up, designed and set up, that if, if something does happen to them, um, they're very easily changed out. So this image here... Uh, with this wood box is basically a drill pattern for the holes that go into the plastic posts and um, which allow brass threaded inserts and then these stainless steel tamper-proof screws to mount the sign to. So uh, that's definitely a little bit more advanced than most people's capabilities to do, but um, it's just an idea of, of things to go uh, to give you ideas of things that you can do in-house. Um, I, uh, I hope this was a little bit informative, and um, you know, if there's any questions at the end you want to ask me, I'll be glad to answer them. Rich, I'm... Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, and the, I know he covered a lot of ground and talked about some specific products, uh, industry uh, proprietary products. Uh, we're going to put up, um, in the after the evaluation, you'll get a post a webinar uh, survey, and Cora said she would include links. And there are some signed uh, materials and images that are posted on the MJV page.
so everybody will have a chance to kind of dig into this. And as Pete says, Google will tell you everything. Uh, I, uh, I do want to mention, please uh, ask any questions that you have. And we're holding questions till the end. But uh, type them in, and uh, Cora, or she Cora or Shelby will pass them on to us, and we're happy to cover them. So let's turn now to Angie Edwards, who is an account executive for uh, uh, Fossil Industries in Deer Park, New York, who produce uh, high-density uh, laminate signs. And uh, she's got a great story to tell about the type of signs and the variety of signs that are possible uh, when dealing with a contract or, or a full-service sign, sign and design shop. So, Angie? Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Good afternoon. I'm going to tell you about the world's most durable signs. Our signs are actually high-pressure laminate. Fossil manufacturers custom high-pressure laminate signs and murals. They are known by the acronym CHPL. Fossil graphics have a full 10-year warranty against UV fading and weather deterioration. They are also graffiti proof and can be cleaned with any solvent with no restrictions of using products containing lacquer thinner or acetone. Many ask the question, what is it printed on? It actually starts out as a paper print. CHPL graphic sign material is composed of several layers of impregnated filler paper, a custom image graphic, a layer of melamine resin, surfaced by a layer of translucent exterior UV graffiti overlay protection. I know that's a mouthful. The entire panel, including exterior overlay, is bonded under heat and extreme pressure to form a composite panel. So a half-inch thick panel would actually start off with about one inch, uh, you know, like an inch thick of paper before it goes through the, the process. Fossil offers panels in a variety of thicknesses from sanded back thin laminate to one inch solid structural panels. The most popular are half inch and eighth inch. Half inch panels normally include threaded inserts on the back. They bolt to walls, railings, and posts without seeing hardware from the front. Eighth inch can be mounted with screws or put in a frame. The top photo shows an eighth inch panel mounted in an MPS style framed pedestal and the bottom photo is a half inch panel mounted on a single post pedestal. This is a half inch panel attached to a rail mount pedestal plate on the right. On the left is a visual of our threaded insert hole and bolt. We make it very easy to install the panels. We offer a full line of mounting hardware options. Here's a popular option, our single post pedestal. Mounting plates are either six inch by six inch to hold up to a 24 by 24 inch panel, or it can be a 12 inch by 12 inch mounting plate, and that can hold up to a 36 by 36 inch panel. Larger panels can be mounted using a double post pedestal. The panels must be half inch or thicker for this type of mounting option. The average cost for this mount is $175. This is a butterfly garden sign done on a single post pedestal. The average cost of a two foot by three foot by half inch panel is $253. The single post pedestal runs about $175 as I mentioned, and we always include an eight inch by 10 inch color sample proof with each order, which is $40. That $40 includes FedEx priority overnight shipping. Without shipping added, you are looking at about $468 for the whole package. That's the panel, the pedestal, and the color proof. Here you have a single wood post plate. This is commonly used when a more rustic or natural look for the sign post is needed. The mounting plate here is 12 inches by 12 inches. As I mentioned earlier, it can hold up to a single sign that's 36 inches by 36 inches. And the average cost for a wood post uh, plate is $88. This is an example of a half inch panel mounted on a wood post with the wood post plate. This is just a closer look at the layout.
Now most orders come in ready to print. This particular layout, the client sent us the text and the images so that we could, we could actually do the design for him. We provide our clients with file prep guidelines. This gives info on what we need from them if they are providing us with the files. In most cases, we use Adobe Illustrator, InDesign, or CorelDRAW. We offer design services. However, we are not a full-service design firm. If we are to design the panel, we must receive the photos, logos, text, and ideas that will comprise the panel. Most panels require about two to three hours of art time to design and create a production-ready file. The cost would be $78 per hour for this service. So on average, this would range from $156 to about $234, depending upon the complexity of the design. Here's an example of a custom shape entrance sign. We are able to achieve custom cuts, as you can see in this photo. This gives you the opportunity to make your sign more appealing to all ages. The custom mount was not done by Fossil. Oftentimes, we only provide the panels, and clients incorporate them into their own mounting hardware. So that may be an option for you as well. The cost of our half-inch material with a profile cut runs about $44 per square foot. Here we have a custom-shaped butterfly panel. Giving sponsorship or donor recognition in the shape of a butterfly may be an idea you'd like to pursue. And thus, this panel is just that. Fossil has a great team to help you from start to finish. You start with your assigned account executive to get your ideas across and develop a quote. Once it becomes in order, a project manager is assigned to oversee every detail of production and keep the client updated along the way. Once the artwork is received, one of our production artists will evaluate the files and convey any issues to the client. After proof approvals, your order will ship within 20 business days. Your project manager will send you email confirmations and anticipated ship dates so you know just what to expect. We believe in great customer service and delivering an outstanding product. Fossil is the number one choice of many state and national parks. Yes, there are many sign choices, but we believe Fossil is the best choice. In closing, I want to thank Rich Dolesh and the others involved for the opportunity to be on this webinar. The Fossil team is here and ready to be of service. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. Um, I hope the um, presentation from Angie, who is in, in a business that produces signs, is valuable to you. And I, I really appreciate the cost estimates that she provided, which gives you a general sense of what it costs to work with a professional design and a, a fabrication sign shop and how really easy it is to do. And, and as I said at the beginning, um, you know, we're, we're really uh, showing the full range of signs from the simple handmade home produced up through the very sophisticated um, and professionally done signs that Pete's agency and Angie's business do. Uh, and, I, and I hope you notice the difference. You know, the, the high quality sign, the professionalism and quality that they strive for is uh, durability, it's um, visual impact, it's professional uh, appearance. Uh, no exposed fasteners, for example. And a lot of thought and technology goes into that. Uh, one of the questions that um, was asked on the chat room and Cora's feeding them to us is um, how and where can you find mounting hardware and mounting brackets for signs? Pete, would you take that one? Um, it's. I, I wish I could say it was simple, um, Rich. Uh, every one of the jobs that we we do, um, that is one of the key uh, factors in in what material we choose, uh, where it's going to be. We have a lot of pools, uh, so all the hardware we would use on the pool deck or near the pool is a stainless steel. Um, the uh, 
again, it's uh, the key is not to have fasteners take away from the look of your sign. So um, a lot of every uh, the stuff that we do in house is uh, blind mounting, like um, the uh, fossil products. Or uh, most of your fasteners are from behind. Um, <laughs> I, I wish that was a an easy um, question to answer um, for anyone out there that's listening. If I, I believe my um, email is is up there now, you can certainly send me a, uh, an email with your specific issue, and I can um, lend you some advice. I mean, that would be the best my best answer, Rich, is because every job is different. Whether you're mounting to wood, uh, aluminum, brick. Uh, more um, e um, even, for instance, I hung some bronze plaques um, on polished black granite walls for the um, U.S. Army. That was a job I had never done before. There was a lot of research that went into it because they would not let me drill into it. So I had to find an adhesive that would work. So e every time you you get a job, it's going to be a different application. I, that's the safest answer I have for you. Well, I, but let me. I'm going to turn. Cora's going to field questions because she's. We're on a, a slightly different platform, and so we don't see them all. I want to mention one last thing in terms of our presentation, um, and the relationship of parks to what Monarch Joint Venture is all about, and what our Parks for Monarchs campaign is. Um, we worked for the past year on a present a preparation of a resources guide and uh, idea um, manual for. Monarch Conservation and Parks, and it applies equally to all public lands. And uh, we appreciate Wendy Caldwell's expert uh, participation and advice and Cora's um, really good participation to contributions. Uh, this is available for download at www.nrpa.org and go to the Parks for Monarchs page. Uh, I don't know if there's a link on the MJV page, but it's a great little guide, lots of good information, encourage you to also sign up for our Parks for Monarchs campaign. Uh, whether you're a park or not, if you're like a park, we want you. So uh, same website address and look for Parks for Monarchs. So I'm going to uh, turn this over to Cora, and Cora, you have the questions. Great. Thanks, Rich. Um, the Parks for Monarchs guide is available on our website, too. Um, and first, you know, before we dive into the questions, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our presenters for being here today. And for everyone who's listening and who has been chiming in on the chat box, um, we I will say that we did record today's webinar. So if you want to share it or come back and watch it again, it will be available online on the Monarch Joint Venture and NCTC websites as soon as it's um, ready and uploaded. Um, and as we mentioned at the beginning, we'll follow up after today's webinar with some additional resources that the presenters have mentioned. Um, and we'll also ask for your feedback in a short survey. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and one resource that I wanted to call out is new on the Monarch Joint Venture website. You can find downloadable graphics to get you started in creating your own signs. So you can go to the resources page on the Monarch Joint Venture website or look for the link in our follow-up email. So um, with that, I'm going to dive into some of the questions that we have had here. We had a question for Pete. Um, this is um, from a participant who is working on creating signage in their rose garden, and they're looking for tamper-proof signs. Um, she says that we have had trouble with people scratching through the individual signs and removing them totally. Uh, what kind of material would you recommend in her situation? You know, uh, we we had a uh, we converted one of our inner uh, Beltway communities uh, parks into a skate park, and we created some really really nice signs. In fact, I made them six times, redid mm -hmm. them six times because they were damaged so bad. Um, I, I completely understand. So one of the reasons I'm such a big fan of the digital print with the UV laminate is because it is inexpensive. It's got a really, really good visual effect. They're very simple to do. And if you are in an area where they are vandalized, you are not, you're not spending hundreds of dollars at a time. You're spending, um, you know, maybe $50 for your sign. And you, you really can get the same look. Um, 
As far as something that's completely vandal proof, I don't believe that exists. Um, mm -hmm. The King Color Core product works very, very good. Its disadvantage is it is soft, but you're going to have to scratch through an eighth inch of the uh, surface color to actually get into having it look differently. I mean, the closer you get, the more you're going to see the scratching. But um, as far as spray paint, it comes right off. Um, that is, I, I think it's going to be an ongoing battle for you. Uh, a lot of our facilities are not in the greatest neighborhoods, unfortunately, so we're dealing with a lot of that. Um, one thing I have found is the more simple and plain your sign is, for some reason, they seem to leave it alone. Uh, that would be the direction I would go. Um, we have pretty standard black and white uh, rule signs for our parks and uh, that one particular skate park we tried to do some really interesting graphics and until we went back to the standard black and white <laughs> rules park sign they trashed everything we put in the one the that park. everybody ignores right yeah it just yeah. blocks it out of there and and, and i hate to say it but that, that that last sign we put in has been probably been there for four years and no one has done anything to it so um unfortunately that is my my uh, experience and the example I can give you. Yeah, uh, I, this is a tough question for any kind of public lands park manager. Uh, you know, how do you deal with vandalism, graffiti? Uh, Angie talked about this, and I, but I hope you'll chime in in a moment, Angie, about how they address it, you know, with their HPL signs. But um, Pete's got a, a good solution is that you you produce them as inexpensively as you can and be prepared to put up the sign again. Uh, Pete, Pete, in our preparation, Pete talked about a cast aluminum sign that they did for a historic site at, that was a very isolated area, about a half-inch aluminum and the laser cutter plasma cut. <laughs> and he said a week later they found 23 bullet holes in it. Yes. yes. So, uh, Angie, how about how do you uh, how do you look at the vandalism and what what does it take to vandalize your HPL signs? Well, our signs are very durable. Um, like like Pete just said, nothing is vandal proof. They're, it just doesn't exist. You know, if they're determined vandals, they're going to do it. You know, and we can't stop them, unfortunately. Um, pretty much, um, with our signs being graffiti proof, and that's like usually the number one. Uh, type of vandalism that that happens with these things, um, you can clean it off with just about any um, solution, um, any you know cleaning agent, and your sign will look just the same as it did prior to the the um, the vandalism of the graffiti. Well, this H high pressure laminate HPL is how it's commonly called. There's a revolution in sign making. Uh, the old signs that you see, uh, kind of tilted traditional National Park Service signs, were often made out of fiberglass embedment. So a paper positive was embedded in a fiberglass matrix, a liquid matrix, and then it dried. And it was good. It lasted a long time, but not if you put it in the sun. And after a period of years, it crazes and yellows, and it really is unattractive. Um, new sign technology now produces really vivid, vibrant colors and gives you unlimited possibilities on how to design and um, shape things. Uh, so I, I think the problem of vandalism is one you just got to live with and, and deal with as best as you can. But as Pete said, there's some low-cost ways that you can attempt to deal with it and, and uh, you know, make the best of it. Cora, go ahead. Thank you all. That was a really great answer to that question. Um, so we've had a few questions come in that are asking for kind of product recommendations for different scenarios. So one of those scenarios is um, making inexpensive signs for a school garden, and they're thinking about a laminate. So they were wondering what are some of the best materials that would be inexpensive um, to use. And this might kind of go back to what you were talking about earlier, Pete. So, so, so uh, again, each each application is slightly different. I am a, a huge fan of um, expanded PVC. It's a product called Comatex. It comes in one mil up to eighteen mil thick, and depending on the application, um, 
you can drill it and use a tap to put threads in it and stud mount it directly in the half inch material. You do not need threaded inserts. Um, the vegetable images uh, in the presentation are mounted that exact way. Um, so there's a lot of different vinyl manufacturers out there. There's a lot of different UV laminates. They're rated in years. The longevity, the, the, their life expectancy over the past 10 years has, has grown immensely. I, it was not a product I would, have, I would have pushed anyone towards 10 years ago, but the ink quality, the material, the laminate, um, you can get it in gloss, satin, matte, uh, and again, I, I meant to try to dig up some more information. There's a company called GH Imaging. I was just calling around before the presentation to, to think of, to get some names of places that you could upload your images to. They will digitally print, laminate, and cut whatever shape you want. Um, and I believe they have a minimum 10 square foot charge, but it's $4.98 a square foot for your image with a 10-year UV laminate on it. So that's a pressure-sensitive vinyl, and the, the, the adhesion is definitely going to determine what or be determined by what you put it on, um, whether it's a plastic, a stainless steel, vinyl, glass, uh, PVC. They all have different, um, I guess they call it surface energy, so there's low surface energy, high surface energy. Um, so all of those things kind of come into play, but as far as inexpensive and doing it yourself in-house for school vegetable garden, I would definitely, my suggestion would be go with, with uh, pressure-sensitive vinyl with the UV laminate on it, and you can get um, any number of substrates that you could probably cut on a bandsaw in a school. I don't know if your school has a shop or not, but and then just apply the vinyl to that. You can actually even mount through face mount your, your substrate to however you're going to do it and then apply the vinyl over your screws so you do not see the fasteners. Um, that's a simple way to um, hang your your sign without seeing the fasteners. It's an advantage. Yeah, the, uh, and, and for a totally low-budget, school-budget uh, price, you could mount it on painted plywood, frankly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a really good point. Um, there's there's some, some bulletin oil-based paints that are absolutely phenomenal. You'll get like 8 to 10 years with, with, with the finish on them in the sun. They're just very good. It's a sign... Um, Sign industry paint, bulletin paints, um, but the to go back to the to the the, the vinyl material, it's um, it, it's extremely cost effective if you have a graphics program to to upload your images, send it out. Um, GH is in Minnesota. Again, I've never used them. But the prices are are pretty good, and the gentleman I talked to seemed extremely helpful. Um, yeah, that's that would be my my advice. There are some uh, sign companies, wholesale and retail sign supply companies, that sell only to the trade, to uh, yes, uh, retail yes, industry. They, mm -hmm. But there's others who, where you can buy as an individual customer, uh, or uh, you know, for for example, for a school, they might be able to create an account. Uh, there's a magazine, sign industry magazine called Signcraft, S I G N C R A F T, one word, and they have an online. Uh, version of their magazine, but they you'll see a variety of advertising from a variety of vendors that uh, really give you a lot of possibilities. As Pete said, all you need is the graphics program or the image, and you can uh, kind of get uh, get these things produced or the components of them, and you put them together. Yeah, and, you know, I, 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 a lot of people don't generally like to go towards banners, but here I will, uh, this is a company that I use um, outside of work for myself, banners.com. Uh, they are very inexpensive. You can get a 13-ounce outdoor banner, full-color graphics. It's the absolutely the cheapest or inexpensive place to buy banners. The grommets don't cost anything extra. All the seams are, are welded. Uh, they will reinforce the hems for you. You can order, and it, the price is right in front of you. The, the, the up the site works wonderfully. The turnaround time is very, very good. They can print uh, 15 feet wide by however long you want. Um, so you can get an enormous banner. Uh, so as far as 
bang for your dollar. That is yeah. just really what you need for your for your hundred foot way station. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not. It, it really is. I, they can actually output batters cheaper than I can in house here at work. Uh, Angie, on, in terms of um, doing low cost or or signs that have been vandalized, I'm presuming you save the sign data information, and then is the replacement cost the same, or is it relatively cheaper, or we do, we do, in most cases, try and discount the, the replacement signs. And we do save the artwork in our archives. Um, because we have such a vast amount of orders going through Fossil, we are only guaranteed to hold the art for a year. Okay, but will you provide the file to people, if, or, or rather if they do their own, they can, of course, save their own file? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Go ahead, Cora. Great. Um, are there any specific recommendations that you would have um, to be efficient in long-term cold weather exposure? Are those recommendations any different? Uh, who is that question to? Me? Uh, yeah, I think we can start with you, Pete. Um, well, again, um, uh, one of the products I like to use is uh, Comatex. It's an expanded PVC. It's a great product until can, it gets can cold. Can you spell that, Pete? Yeah, it's K O M. K-O-M-A-T-E-X. Uh, -E um, there's, a, there's a couple different methods. Centra is one. Trovacel is another. Comatex, it's all the same. It's, it's basically like PVC, rigid PVC, except it's, it's expanded, so it's a little bit lighter, a little bit softer. They're great products until it gets cold, and then they break very easily. Um, so there's different types of plastic. All have their positives. All have their negatives. Um, Aluminum is a great product. Most of the pressure-sensitive vinyls have an extremely large working range of temperature. Um, I think in excess of like 250 degrees to like negative 50 or something like that. They, it, 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 you know, if you're picking at it or scratching at it, that's one thing. But if it's just sitting there, once it's set. Um, the acrylic-based vinyl uh, adhesives are very, very tough. Um, that, again, each application is going to be slightly different. Is it a flat surface? Is it smooth? Uh, is it textured? They're all going to work, respond differently to the vinyl. Um, you know, if it's going around a, a, um, a um, what is the word, of a, a sphere or something, you know, uh, it's going to... That's going to have a great effect on what the heat and the cold do to your, your signage or your graphics that you've applied, uh, like if it's a vehicle wrap. Um, depending on how deep the crevice is that you're forcing the vinyl down into is going to be greatly affected when the sun's been beating on it for three years. Um, so, uh, again, um, I'm open to if you want to email me individually with a little bit more um, uh, detailed information, I might be able to answer the question a little bit better. You, you might have a fun time with a couple <laughs> of questions. <laughs> Angie, do you have a temperature range on uh, fossil signs? No, we don't. Fossil graphics last in the most extreme temperatures. I personally hold the contract with Alaska State Parks, and um, they have no issues with, you know, the cold or anything of that nature. And the same goes for moisture. This seems uh, the edges are sealed and, and very resistant, right? Yes, they are. They are impervious to moisture, yes. Okay, Cora, go ahead. All right. Um, I think this one might be a question for you, Rich, on um, what height recommendations do you have for signs? Oh, boy, that's a good question. Uh, you really, you know, just on the Smithsonian sign example, <laughs> Um, you need to look for ADA compliance. So essentially your signs have to be visible and accessible for those uh, with a physical disability or in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And um, but, the, but depending, as I said, on the context, if you're placing a sign in the middle of a garden where milkweed is going to grow up six or eight feet, you, you really want to place that sign in a way that will be visible and accessible throughout the seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, same goes if, if it's going to be seen off a trail or perhaps even viewed uh, from a car. Mm -hmm. So the height recommendations are you really need to kind of test them out, but know that if you are placing them where uh, they're in a accessible, that they need to be accessible for all 
visitors of all abilities to see them, you need to look at ADA compliance regulations. That's a really great thing to be considering. Thanks for that, Rich. Um, we do have another question. Um, I, I'll start with you, Rich, and then if others have an answer to this, feel free to join in. Um, are there any hands-on workshops or trainings that you know of for people who want to dig in a little more? Um, no. <laughs> in fact, okay. it was one reason why we selected this topic that yeah. you uh, – there, there are – there are professional sign design workshops and, and things that are put on by the industry, but it's often more for the people who are in the trade or professional uh, illustrators or exhibit makers. We, uh, we may, based on the popularity of this, we may consider doing something at the NRPA's annual conference, uh, which this year is going to be in New Orleans, September 27th to 29th, but mm -hmm. may look at this for a future. We might consider doing some more detailed webinars on specific types of signs or, uh, so, you know, actual sign design uh, in the down in the weeds. Mm -hmm. uh, you had, um, Cora, I saw one of the questions come up about hashtags. And yeah. I don't want to miss that one. I purposely, we purposely kept the content of this to the physical sign and the placement of signs and construction and fabrication of signs uh, without going into how signs are moving into a new dimension of communications. And the use of QR codes and hashtags and others that will give you expanded information. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to uh, magnify the content and impact of your signs, especially in educational signs. Mm -hmm. And if you notice that one sign for Elwood, I, I forget the uh, Elwood Farm or Elwood um, Garden. Elwood, Maine, in Goleta. Yeah, mm -hmm. that uh, you know that had a, a locator map and a and a further inset for how to find additional information. So QR codes are a great way to expand content, and you'll find that a lot of people who are if you're in a formal garden or in a garden where there's a planned path or a unique and seasonal displays gives you a lot of variety and flexibility to change the content and make it adaptable uh, yeah. for plants that might be in a bloom, you know, right at the time that they bloom or uh, when they're dead. Yeah. Cora, can I go back to the, the uh, inexpensive sign for the school? Um, I just, it mm -hmm. just dawned on me. There's a, there's a product that I use for the first time uh, about a year ago. It's called Art Resin. They've got a great, great, great website. It's a two-part uh, optically clear um, epoxy, low VHC. You don't need any respirator. You don't need anything at all. Their website is absolutely fantastic. Uh, they have instructional videos. They have, uh, they, they've got thousands of instructional videos. Um, the woman, I guess, that who's in most of the videos, she's actually doing art uh, with this with her baby in a little um, chest carrier. So it's it's like 100% safe. So the other thing is it's got UV stabilizers in it. So I believe you could actually encase your paper art the kids might do in this on a piece of plywood and then put that outside. They have done tests. I don't believe they have any um, technical data on the outdoor life. I know mm -hmm. they've had people that have stuff outside that it's lasted a long time. I just don't know what the longevity is, but it really, the product is fantastic, and I art, have used art it. Art Resin, it's right? It's called Art Resin, A-R-T-R-E-S-I-N, and the, the website is absolutely fantastic. Great. I'm going to go through it right after. Yes. Work. I recommend everyone, whoever, who's interested in making any signs or anything, indoor or outdoor, check it out. It, it, it really gives an, an, an incredible pop to whatever you're doing. That's great. Yeah. So oh. there was a question directed to me, how efficient and popular are QR codes in signs? Rich just touched a, a bit on, on QR signs. We are seeing that come in more. It's becoming more popular. And what we do is we actually make um, one of the proofs with the QR code so that we can have it tested, make sure it works well and everything. And of course, with all of our signs, it also has, you know, once it's all said and done, it's it has our full 10-year warranty against UV fading and weather deterioration, so it will definitely hold up over time. Uh, how, how much, uh, Angie, do you see that the, um, 
places are moving to adding the the kind of the social media or the hashtag or QR code. That's becoming more and more popular. Um, it, it, I, I wouldn't say that that you know a ton of orders come in like that, but it definitely we are definitely starting to see more of it. Okay, Cora, I see we're coming to the end. Any other questions that are? We had one more question that um, that I saw that we didn't get to, which was recommendations or cautions with regard to how to clean a sign. Um, so if we can answer that quickly, then we can we can dive into that briefly as our last question. Uh, Pete, you want to go to that? I mean, <laughs> I wish I had simple answers to these questions. Yeah. Um, anything that has acrylic on it, don't use anything but a very mild mild dish soap and water. Mm -hmm. Or there's a product called Brilliantize, which is a plastic cleaner, kind of expensive, and it does go bad. It's got a shelf life. It'll develop mold on the inside. Um, uh, the King Color Core, you could use anything on gasoline. Yeah, it won't hurt it. Simple Green HD, even regular Simple Green, they're the non-toxic bio, uh, you know, safe cleaners are would be recommended. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that I would test I would test a cleaner on on something before I used it on any sign. I would I would just it's just kind of a precautionary thing you, you you learn through the years that you don't I don't recommend just pouring something on there because somebody told you that they thought it worked because it can it can be quite costly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just I'm just saying. <laughs> Oh, Pete right. told me I could choose this. Yeah, as, as Angie I'll be getting said, Haiti bills. <laughs> as Angie said, the HPL signs are um, really durable and can be cleaned with almost anything. Absolutely. Yeah, if a manufacturer says you can do that, I would, I would, I think that's very, very safe to to do. Yeah. For the most part, easy, you know, easy um, cleanups can just be done with a wet cloth. Um, Mild procedures, you can use, like you guys mentioned, simple green, goof off, graffiti solutions, things of that nature. And then if it's something really tough, you can use um, turpentine, mineral spirits, rubbing alcohol, WD-40, or MEC. And MEC is pretty nasty. So in yeah, order to be able to use pretty that, nasty. Yeah. You, you, you know you. that our, our panels are definitely durable. Yeah, MEC is what? Methyl ethyl, methyl ethyl ketone. Ketone, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty nasty stuff. stuff. Cleaner, you guys be very <laughs> careful with. Yeah, yeah, be careful with yourself with that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Not just, not just your sign. <laughs> Good to know. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, that's all we, the time we have for questions. And just a huge thanks again to Rich, Pete, and Angie for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I also want to say a big thank you to NCTC for hosting our webinar series and to all of you here for participating. Um, our next webinar is coming up on March 23rd um, on monarch parasitoids with experts from the University of Minnesota Monarch Lab and the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. So check out the Monarch Joint Venture website to find out more about our upcoming webinars, and we'll hope to see you on the next one. Thanks, everyone, and um, have a great day. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Cora. Yeah, thank, thank you.